Hello. Okay, we still have lots of you coming in. I'm going to guess that uh, things are a bit slow to get started today, given all of the exciting events of yesterday. I hope everyone's okay. Um, and um, that you all have power. I'm assuming that if you don't, you're not here. And so everybody who doesn't have power and who is hand. not here, please raise your hand. Um, so we may be a couple of minutes over time uh, just because we're going to take a couple of minutes to get started here. But no, no worries. We'll record everything, of course. Once again, kudos on your coloring. Look yeah. The veins on that. They're, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So nice. Well done. Well done, well done, well done, and congratulations, midterm two over. Woohoo! Um, we hope that um, in writing it, you were like, this is pretty much the same kind of style as last time, so I hope it felt familiar. Um, the uh, final exam will be very familiar, so very similar to uh, what you went through um, in the first two midterms, of course. So the cat's name is Caramel, oh, yeah. and the there is a quiz for A and B. Is that Neil's course? Uh, that started at 8. And so that's why everybody's coming. Thank you. That's yep. great. Okay. And a huge tree fell down, <gasps> lots of power out, people talking about power out. Okay. Um, yeah, hope if you're at particularly the North Shore of Lake Erie, which is a special place for uh, in yeah. our hearts. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope the waves did not get that big, and I hope we did not witness the end of the Fowler's Toad in Canada. Um, yeah. Dougie does look big right now. Oh, Doug's a big dog now. I didn't see it, and we looked at some pictures when he arrived. And, yeah. Uh, Lily can walk under him without brushing the bottom of his belly now. He doesn't now. even notice. Uh, okay, so thank you all very much for your drawings. I am going to clear them. Uh, oh, I love the arrows on the blue flower. That's really cool. And the hearts. And look at you. You're all awesome. A plus. Okay, cool. So um, can you, uh, no, I can clear the drawings. Clear all drawings. Bye. Yeah, which, which towns? There's a couple of people, uh, Bark and Birk, Birk and Bark. Birkenberg. <laughs> Live near Lake Erie. Lake completely flooded the town. Uh, other town is flooded. We like this Port, oh, Col Port Colburn, Port yeah. Rowan. All of those areas got some super yeah. flooding. I hope everyone's dry and safe. Okay, uh, we have to catch up a little bit with last time. No big deal at all. Oh, Dover. Uh, Dover, Port Dover, right. Thank you. Um, okay, and yeah, uh, yeah. so we're going to kind of dive in, uh, talking a little bit, uh, just to kind of wrap up some of the things that we were introducing the last time. We decided to slow it down because the graphing stuff is really cool, and there's, you know, graphing skills that are required, and so we wanted to uh, spend some more time on that. And we have some cool stories, and yeah. I'm a sucker for the stories. The stories are good, so we're going to have to, like, to get him to tone it down or to like once upon a wrap time. it up because there are a lot of stories in this particular lecture. You want me to tell a story lecture? like uh, no. how Jack and Daniel tell stories? No. <laughs> okay, so I think this is where we left off, right? I think you do. Uh, no. Um, I think this is where we left off. And we left off with a question. Thinking a little bit about like WTF for not being related to temperature, but rather the trigger being related to photo period, right? Why the frack? Why the frack? And this is previously on Biology 1070. That's right. So, um, uh, and the particular um, sort of trait that we were talking about was the upregulation of these antifreeze proteins, right? So why? Why is it photo period and why is it not directly temperature? Um, and that's up to you. So let's put it in the chat <laughs> before we move on. Why? What are some hypotheses that might uh, help to explain why the trigger for the upregulation of antifreeze proteins would be uh, photo period and not temperature? Uh, of course. Uh, Zoom does not want me to look at any other. Zoom window. doesn't want you to look at anything but Zoom. That's incredible. So frack you, Zoom. Ah, temperature can fluctuate. These are some good thoughts already. Ah. Yeah. Um, photo period's a lot more consistent. Photo period's more consistent. <gasps> Temperature's all over the place. Oh my goodness. This one's a really good one. Um, fish? It's not true, but it's a really good one. Um, fish have a better sense of light than temperature. 
super interesting. Um, in this case, it's, it doesn't seem to be that reason, but that is a perfectly plausible reason uh, that you can test and that you can study. And my prediction would be that you wouldn't find, you wouldn't find evidence to support it, but that doesn't mean that it isn't completely plausible in this context. So excellent work. Other ones? You're talking about the link, the closely related yeah. the photo period can change before the temperature. Super uh, good. Giving, permitting time. Uh, light changes before temp. Light affects the protein perhaps directly. That's also right. not the, really the case, but, but a great hypothesis. Yep. Photo period is more consistent. Temperature is way all over the place. Temperature yep. can fluctuate throughout a season. Photo period is consistent. Good. And I like the fact that, fin yeah, like you said, fish have a better sense. Fish actually have a better sense of ennui. <laughs> Um, so why do we, how do we know, or how can we test whether fish, whether it's really that fish have a better sense of temperature or not? So even if we have a test and we show that fish can sense light or like the just noticeable difference of light sensation is, is much more fine and sensitive than it is for, um, for temperature. The other sort of supporting evidence of this would be to take a look at what other things are triggered by photo period rather than temperature and and the answer and again you didn't know this but there's like a lot yeah. <laughs> a whole whack of things so it's not likely if if this was just fish specific then i would i would totally buy that um but it isn't actually and that's what we're going to kind of get into right now so yeah. we think that it is more about this idea about photo period being a proxy for temperature where temperature fluctuates both seasonally, so chronically, as well as daily, acutely, it's got a lot of noise built into that to that particular trigger, right? Um, and photo period doesn't fluctuate um, daily. Now, it does get dark and light, but photo period is what we're talking about. We're not talking about um, you know the the daily fluctuations we're talking about the seasonal fluctuations when we're talking about photo period so as we go in and talk about some more examples here yeah. um, examples. into the terrestrial environment keep in the back of your brain start fermenting in the back of your brain Maybe reasons, here, like reasons why this might be a problem yes for contemporary organisms where it would not have been a problem in the past so we're going to leave some tasty fishes, uh, nasty, nasty fishes, and says we, Gollum. And we're going to talk about rabbits, uh, which yeah. Gollum also liked. Hares. We're talking about hares. Yeah. Yep. Hares in the north. Hares in the north that in the summertime have a nice cryptic color, a brown color, that is broken up a tiny little bit <laughs> and you can uh, makes it very hard to see. They're also fast, but yes. a lot of their principal way of avoiding predation is not being seen. Right. Now, in the... And this hair is not sticking out its tongue, but it's just super coincident I with the flower in the it. background. Now, you're telling me to... Give me control. You focus. In the wintertime, when the hairs aren't sticking out their tongue to the delight of Dr. Jacobs, this is the cryptic coloration that they assume. The complete switch of their guard hairs, which is kind of a big investment, but results in a hair that is very hard to see and very hard to predate in the wintertime. Right, so check it out. That's what they look like in uh, the winter, and then this is what they look like uh, in. Now, the actually, summer. so if you go ahead again to the winter time, see that rock? That would be what the hair would look like if it did nice. not change. Good deal. It would be um, as Super easy to visible. predate as a rock. <laughs> okay, and so here's a bunch of like conundra. Is that like is that wow. the plural? Is it conundra? Okay, so. Um, this is your slide. Yeah, I've... so why do some <laughs> arctic animals seasonally molt to white fur coats? Well, you know this, some of, um, and you know this intuitively, or you've known because you've seen it. Maybe some of you have hunted or, or trapped these things or beaten them. Uh, and if you've done the first two, hopefully you've done the third. Uh, that there's a strong correspondence between when they molt, the phenology of when it molts, the timing of the year, and the duration of local snow cover. Um, the other reason, and we'll talk about the graph in a second here, but their other reason is that the winter, the white guard hairs, there's a, there's a tiny little insulative value. We've kind of emphasized the cryptic coloration, but there's slightly more insulative values. Now, take a look at the graphs. There's four of them on the uh, right-hand side, and you'll see that the comparison we're making there is the Yukon in the fall on the right-hand side to the winter on the left-hand side. And in each case, the length of the guard hair goes up 
the length of the downy hair goes up, the density of the downy hair goes up. So all of these triggers um, changing seasonally. So the coat of, this, uh, of these Arctic hairs is changing fundamentally throughout this year. And now the signal, why, so okay, so you can probably intuitively agree that uh, in the wintertime you'd want to be warmer and this coat allows you to do it, but why then change color and what's going to be the signal that gets you there? Cool. The prochaine one, the next slide. <laughs> and there's a problem. Like, what's the problem? An interesting problem, because now that we've established that being white on a white background is good and being brown on a brown background is good, but that you should make sure that you're aligned with the seasons. Look at that loser hair in none of it. Look at this one in Resolute. Both of these photos were taken in the summer when there are these brown backgrounds. And this guy is completely white. And it turns out that there is a line that divides the Arctic above which the hairs don't change color. Mm, I and love that be line. below which the hairs do change color. So you're gonna, um, we're gonna see, show you a slide. So if you don't actually know where Resolute is in none of it, uh, or Churchill, we can point them out in I think the next slide. I'm oh. show you right here. So it turns out, so Resolute is right here. Here. How many times have you been in Resolute? A lot. I've only been there once. Once? Who's following you? Oh, that's right. We yeah. flew out of there once. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So lots and lots she, of She times. knew I was there. Mm. And Resolute Bay um, actually has a, a really, oh, I, it's not interesting, no. terrible history. Yep. Um, people that um, were on their ancestral lands in more southern areas of the Arctic for thousands and thousands of years. With um, hunting cultures and yeah. knowledge adapted to a completely different, like it's just, it's kind of bananas. Bananas. The, the, the um, my colonial way is right style of thinking that led to this. So these, uh, so uh, families were displaced to Resolute, forced to live there um, as uh, support for the sovereignty claims of the Canadian government over the Arctic. They decided that it would be a good idea to occupy more northern latitudes. Resolute is not a place uh, to live, and it's certainly not a place to be um, like immediately displaced if you're used to hunting uh, and fishing species that aren't even there. Um, the government promised that they would be back with a boat of supplies. They never showed up. It was awful. Yeah. And Winter still disease people are there. Um, yeah, so many people died and still families are there from that legacy. So it's... it's this is uh, not a long time yeah. ago either. This is no. like the 50s, 60s. Yeah, Nin terrible story. 1950s, 60s, and 60s. And um, there is a, a Canadian uh, a federal government research center there called the Polar Continental Shelf Project. One of the stations is there, and so I passed through there quite a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a place to visit um, or not. Um, but Thinking about the hares. The hares are always there, the have hares, always been they've there. They've been there, they were there. And uh, they and don't change color. Sorry, let's show, uh, if you don't know where Churchill is. Churchill's down there. It's right there. Okay, the thank cursor. you. Okay, so this is a hare so from sub Churchill. Arctic. Like right here on this river, right here. And this is a hare from Resolute, uh, right here. Um, and this hair will never change color. It always stays white. And this one uh, goes between brown and white. And so they are the same species. Uh, yep. They can interbreed. And it's a bit of a question mark. Why? <laughs> right? And so now that we've already established, though, that it's beneficial for these guys to change color in order to be able to um, stay hidden from prey, uh, this case of the resolute or the northern latitude arctic hare is a bit of a, a, a question mark. And it turns out that, of course, this is a terrible, terrible graph. Yeah, we need we to like, get rid of this. This is change not what I put in. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, super low resolution. Yeah, um, okay, but it turns out that there are many, many other species. There are nine uh, mammals um, that either live at high elevation or at high latitude that also change color, right? And so the whole idea then of this one population or one group of hairs not changing color 
is again a question. Can I throw right? in something here? Yeah. This this isn't that many to me. This this is an impressive slide, and I I, I like looking at these maps uh, in their higher quality form because. Of all the species in the world, of all the species that live in the north, this is actually a strategy that independently, because these are not all hair lineages, there's a hamster here, there's, um, I was going to say measles, but let's call them weasels. <laughs> um, there are a bunch of different hares and, and rabbits, but there's a fox. fox. And, and yeah. so independently, this is a strategy that a small number of, of mammals, in this case, have adopted. Yep. So there must be clearly a value we've talked about that at either high latitude and or high elevation mm -hmm. but what are the signals that the independently all of these things have come up with it must be a big signal so um yes it is and uh the other thing that we know about the arctic hair and the trigger is that it is also photo period and yeah. we've known this for a while um, it was first published in 1942, and I can bet you that people have known about it for a few thousand years, even before that, right? But anyway, first published in the scientific literature in, like, the early 40s. So we know that it's photoperiod again, and not temperature. So think about it a little bit, because the photoperiod changes of the high Arctic population of hair are going to be very different than the photoperiod changes of the lower one, right? And we need to think about it in the context of climate change, right? As we need to think about all of these things that we speak of. That's right. So we have photoperiod and we have um, temperature, right? As, so photoperiod is a proxy for temperature. What are some of the challenges in the context of, of climate change, though? In a warming environment, what's going to happen to that trigger? And we've talked about this a little bit. And you can pop it in the chat, too. With, like. re in, with regard to the ice and in some of the food web things that we talked about at the end of the last unit. Yep. Any ideas? If you move... I see nothing in the... If you move... Uh, light doesn't change, but the snow will melt. Right. That's getting right into it right That's away. That's getting right into so it, So it, it's the... The snow is becoming much less dependable. Mm -hmm. The amount of it and when it falls and how long it stays. As a result of temperature. So what you end up happen, having then is for you know a million years or more, um, there was this strong association between photoperiod and temperature, yeah. right? Um, and now what's happening in the context of climate change is that that association is decoupling, yeah. okay? So even though you have the evolution of a trait like fur color change linked to photoperiod, that's not going to unlink necessarily unless there's a mutation that allows for that unlinking that gets selected for blah, 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 right? But for now, that decoupling of temperature in association with that photoperiod trigger is going to cause a real problem for the species that have traits that are linked to photoperiod as a proxy for temperature. Again with the pasting. Again with the weird. pasting. It's no, yeah, yeah so sorry this about is, that. We'll yeah, clean so it up. This is a, just a note in here that there are... Uh, there's research that goes on into this and looking in across Canada and across the Arctic parts or the near Arctic parts of the excited States of America that there's increasingly color mismatch now when you think about you've been through the last kind of uh, of the midterms the neck the final one it comes up as dr. Jacob said same kinds of questions think about this probably already as you read that that the title that you're thinking of consequences in terms of predation. Remember in the ecology unit we talked about predation as being one part of an equation that looked at how whether your population was expanding or, or contracting. It was a loss, right? This is a scenario that you could build a question around if this happens and this scenario could be one that we'd ask questions about ecology. What happens if this rate, da 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 da, da how does this change the rate of predation? It could be a question that we ask about physiology and it could be a, re a question, a scenario about which we ask evolutionary issues if this happens over a long time. So let's practice. Here's oh. your question. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> there we go. Here's a question. Take some time. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. got uh, Mr. Mendez in my head. Yeah. I'm going to put us on mute so that they can think. Is the poll? Why don't I see the poll this time? We're on mute now. Okay. 
it says, am I still logged in from my... Just if if I am, yeah. um, I'm gonna try and screen grab it before we go. Screen grab what? The poll. Okay. Why? Because I insert them in the PDFs. But we can. They'll be in the record. Oh, in the PDF. Okay. But only 300 people at most are watching the videos, which is fine. Yeah. And how many do we have with us now? 269. That's so it's okay. about, yeah. it, it might be exactly that window. Half. Yeah. Plus or minus. Yeah. Almost, almost a full moon. Okay. Let's make some soup. Let's give you a few more seconds here. Wonderful. Interestingly, it is not on the screen here. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, we're very, very close to 90%, so super well done. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, and you've done really well, so you totally got, what's that? You totally got it. Um, I'm sharing the results with you right now. So the answer uh, is A. Um, important to understand that both of these populations are going to be affected, right, in the context of climate change, um, but for kind of different reasons, right? So in the north, the um, sort of, you know, darker background season is going to be much longer. So they're going to be in contrast for much longer period. And then in uh, the southern population, um, because the trigger is decoupled with uh, the proxy for temperature, um, the uh, southern population hares are going to be in contrast in these shoulder seasons uh, where they haven't been before. So for both reasons, we would anticipate an increase in predation. I don't know how recent that... Uh, oh, the sound is off. I think it might be before because we did turn it off and we were still talking. And we were still talking. Can you hear us now? Can you hear me now? Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. We turned it off mute because Smith likes to talk um, <laughs> um, while you were doing the question. So thank you very much for letting us know. Um, okay, so I hope that makes sense. Um, so for, you know, different reasons, we would have, we would predict a very similar condition or effect of, um, of, uh, of climate change. Well done. Okay, and now we're going to throw out some terms at you, some more things, right, uh, to kind of add to the conversation. Terms, terms, terms glorious terms. Okay, um, so this is kind of fun, um, and again, it's like stuff to kind of like really dive deeply in when we when we talk about you know what what the language means um, and sort of the limits of the language. So we want to talk about the difference between freeze avoidance and freeze tolerance. Right? So just kind of dive into what those mean. Uh, something that avoids freezing cannot freeze or it will die. Right? And something that can tolerate freezing uh, okay. can tolerate it and not die. So can be frozen and not die. Right? Which, let's just take a moment to say, it's pretty freaking amazing. Pretty cool. And these two terms are independent of the actual temperature that we're talking about. And that's really important yeah. because something that avoids freezing can be below zero, but is just not frozen. And that's called super cooling. Um, and something that can tolerate freezing can be above zero, but it's like frozen solid. Okay. And, and this is really an important thing. So it is independent of actual temperature. You need to always ask yourself, is the tissue, <laughs> is the tissue frozen? Okay. Is the tissue frozen? <laughs> so freeze avoidance is a very, very common trait, right? Very common uh, ad adaptation, right? We're going to just avoid freezing. And you can, you can imagine those things that are freeze tolerant 
probably couldn't avoid it, right? So maybe they have very short legs. Maybe they don't migrate. <laughs> maybe they don't move. Um, a whole bunch maybe, of reasons. Well, and let's so so you, your examples emphasize the negatives of it. Maybe the positives are if you stay in the same place, you get a head start, and you don't have to invest in returning to a place. You're there, and as soon as the conditions are good, you're like. Ha, 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 ha. I right here. outside my door. <laughs> okay, so so yes, there are there are definitely pros and cons associated with each of the strategies, right? Um, if you migrate, y you got to go far. That's a lot of energy, right? Yeah. Um, danger, and, danger. And it's not necessarily that the energy is less. Um, it's just that it was good enough to give those mutations an ad advantage, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, but some of the examples of free to, freeze avoidance are behavioral, so migration. Uh, we also have antifreeze proteins, right? To avoid freezing, they are antifreeze. Um, we have hibernation. Uh, we have supercooling, so you can bring, supercooling means you bring your body temperature below zero, so it should be frozen, but it isn't. So antifreeze proteins can play a role in that. Yeah, so there's not, these things aren't necessarily independent. That's right. Um, and then dehydration too. You can just like remove the water so it doesn't freeze. Um, and that can also play into freeze tolerance. So yeah. these are not, again, not mutually exclusive um, and very much interconnected. So we have a red box for you to think about a little bit. Um, and uh, we also may have some time for a little graphing exercise. Oh, we will. Oh, we will. Freeze tolerance means that the organism can freeze solid right and of course <laughs> there are some ridiculous examples of species and we may throw these at you for for some some testing purposes organisms where like half their body freezes solid and the other half doesn't that's messed up right and you you can bet that it's going to be a bug of some kind or an insect of some kind <laughs> so yeah so so there are these beautiful exceptions but generally, if the individual is frozen solid at the individual level, then it is freeze tolerant. There are some examples though, like I've said, where there are organ systems that are freeze tolerant uh, and others that are not, and it's all just kind of messy and beautiful. But that's, so what we're talking about here in terms of the adaptations are things like dehydration can also be used for freeze tolerance. Um, and then ice nucleating proteins, which is basically like the opposite of antifreeze proteins. These are proteins that cause ice to form. And the good thing about them is that- Where they do it. They are in particular locations, right? So you wouldn't have ice nucleating proteins like inside your cell. If you did, that'd be bad. That'd be bad. And somebody's already thinking about Ice Age. And in this case, the squirrel. Yeah. Half frozen, half unfrozen. So we could also, we could think about a final <laughs> exam question that involved the squirrel. Ooh, yeah. That would be fun. And, and where would you expect endotherm. to find ice nucleating proteins in right. the inter... Uh, what is this? Screech? Is it? Scratch? Scratch. Scritch? Scritch. I don't know. What's the, what's the, what's the squirrel's name? <laughs> okay. Scratch. Scratch. Thank you. <laughs> A plus. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So now let's play. What do, what, what do you want to put on the axes to kind of help understand some of the differences or not differences in freeze tolerance and freeze avoidance? Well, what should we do? Should we do temperature? Should we do Julian day? We do... <laughs> okay. Let's do... Uh, we're, we're what gonna... should we do first? What, yeah. should you, or what should you always do first? Let's talk, make axes. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's, let's talk about an ectotherm first. Okay. So it's going to be an ectotherm, which means that um, internal temperature and external temperature are going to be very much in line. And let's draw like over a season, say. So let's put summer over near like where the X, Y intersect. And going into the winter, let's draw the temperature profile of an ectotherm that is freeze tolerant. Where is, oh, I'm having trouble, uh, I'm having trouble accessing my Zoom tools while you're all doing this, so if somebody wouldn't mind, What's that? you could put 
Uh, oh, this is good. Yeah, no, you're doing good. We don't even need to label the axes. You've got it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Smith for doing that. Thank you. Apparently my writing suggests I might be having a stroke. <laughs> no, you're okay. Okay, that's great. Super, excellent. Okay, freeze tolerance looks like this, right? Amazing. Now, imagine that we're talking, let's clear. Clear all drawings. Clear all drawings. And let's imagine that we are going to do uh, an ectotherm that is freeze avoiding. What would that look like? Mmm. Yes, I like I like the curvy ones. Those are um good. Yeah, the flat ones probably not, right? Um, because uh, this is an ectotherm, right? Okay, so the curvy ones are good. Like it's gonna get down to a temperature that's that's in line with the environment and it's gonna be at freezing probably. So we'll probably put like a zero um, along those lines and it's avoiding freezing, so it's not. Okay, excellent. Now let's clear and let's imagine that the ectotherm can super cool over that time period. So a super cooling ectotherm over that same time period. Sweet. Yep. Well done. Okay. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And the big problem I hope you've recognized is that we can identify the freeze avoidance strategy with these axes, but how do we know the difference between a freeze tolerant endotherm or ectotherm, sorry, a freeze tolerant ectotherm and a super cooling ectotherm, right? The graph is essentially the same. So how can we tell the difference? You can write your answer on the slide or you can write it in the, in the chat. What does supercooling mean again? Ah, supercooling means that the body temperature is actually below freezing, but it is not frozen. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, you might read it, reach an asymptote sooner, for sure. You might not. That depends on the external temperature. Okay, so if I were to give you a graph of a freeze tolerant ectotherm, haha, <laughs> there we go, Jasmine, uh, genius. Okay, if we were to give you a graph of a freeze tolerant ectotherm and a super cooling ectotherm with sort of limited range on the y axis, you may very well not be able to tell the difference, right? Um, it may reach uh, an asymptote sooner, and that's entirely possible, right? Supercooling only goes to a certain, you know, amount, and then the thing dies, right? Um, but the ultimate question is, is that ectotherm frozen? <laughs> and that's not something that you can necessarily capture on a graph. So we always do need some more information um, and think about that a little bit. Like, oh yeah, that looks like the profile of what exactly? Okay, so that was just kind of a way of showing that axes matter. Um, and so if we were, for example, to change the axes and on the Y, we would put um, antifreeze protein concentration or ice nucleating uh, concentration um, or, you know, actual sort of number of um, uh, uh, ice crystals. Those types of things would help dive in a little bit more to whether or not this is a freeze tolerant or freeze avoiding. Question is the y-axis body temperature. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. I hope, I, you know, I, I, it doesn't have to be crystal clear, but I hope that that helps as we encourage you to start graphing things to go, oh, wait a second, what does it look like? Um, and what are the limitations? So uh, I've still lost my. Um, oh, I'll go and. Do you uh, mind? Sweep Just up. go. Sweep go. Oh no, it's back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I think I had a few more graphs. You did. Just because you know I thought maybe we would need more pages. Ooh, what's this? Does this it work? Should be. Okay. Let's see. Ready? I hope it works. This is a fun experiment. Yeah. 
This is kind of super cooling um, extraordinaire, right? So without any ice nucleation, you can get water temperature to go below freezing. And if it's very clean water without any kind of jagged edges to allow for, uh, for ice crystal formation, um, you can get super cooled water. Okay. a little bit stunted um, but basically water very clean very clear and then you shake it up and that can cause the nucleation to happen now if you seed it it's working it's working or you can seed it right cool. exactly It is awesome, yeah. right? Okay, so so that's kind of super cooling, like reverse super cooling, right? It was super cooled and now it's actually frozen. Um, but just to show you that it is possible to do these things given certain conditions, right? And then certain conditions can evolve into certain species. And it is, this story is amazing. And in Canada, we have this species and um, this is a frozen frog. So when I was growing up, like a million years ago, this was called Rana sylvatica. Um, the name is now Lithobates sylvaticus, but you can still call it the wood frog. Uh, this is the amphibian in Canada that has the largest distribution. It might be, I'd, I'd have to check this, but I'd pace, place a solid guess on it, the amphibian with the largest distribution in the world. And part of the size of that distribution has to do with the fact that this little puxicle that you see <laughs> is a living frog. This is the, like, a that lot. it can attain in the wintertime, that it will return and breed in the spring and the summer. Yeah. Their call, if you live near a marsh area and you think, wow, there sounds like there's a lot of ducks in the marsh there, and you don't see any ducks, you're... Burp, 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 burp. Oh, that's the call. Uh, that's a, a male wood frog being romantic. <laughs> so they can spend in some parts. And so this distribution extends uh, to and above the tree line. So this is, uh, you can imagine, because of the time of year that that uh, at those places, this is a frog that may spend more than half of its yearly lifespan frozen like a puck. Um, and so they do that because they move the water out of the cells into the extracellular spaces and let ice form there. There are no physiological vital signs that you can't kind of put it up to your ear and go, I can hear the ocean and a heartbeat. It's like neither of those things. But they return to normal within a few hours after thawing. <laughs> now this has, as the slide says, high, to do with high, high concentration of osmolites. So like glucose, glycerol, urea that are sugary things that bathe the internal environment and round the edges of all any of the ice crystals that are forming and control where they do form. Yeah, that's, it's messed up. Lifespan. Uh, this can, so most amphibians don't live long. Uh, yeah. Life is nasty, brutal, and short. And as Kermit said, it's not easy being green, nor is it easy being brown or kind of silvery <laughs> with a little mask across your face as it is for the wood frog. So they might live a long... A really old male or female might be four years old so yeah yeah now the next slide Ooh. is the fact that this is a species about which we know a lot uh, in Canada and in the excited states of America because we have asked questions about where they live and how they can live there so this um, Constantino's paper that has grown out of others and and there's researchers particularly again still at um, Miami University remember if you're going to do graduate work at Miami University you're going to live in Ohio that's going to be a surprise it is always a surprise <laughs> to some of the incoming graduate and undergraduate students they're like Ohio Ohio yeah I'm ready for uh, I'm ready for the beach <laughs> so 
in Northern Ohio, where the Miami University is, and in the University of Western Ontario, where people also study freeze tolerance, they've used these uh, frogs as kind of model systems to understand how they actually do this. So glucose is a cryoprotectant and the dehydration of, of organs. This is, of course, referring to the adults. You can see a male there uh, with a nice chapeau. Okay. And then the egg mass, um, which has some other different advantages that I'm not going to talk about today because we don't have time, just to let you know that I'm yeah. not talking about all the things that I want to talk about. Next slide! Next slide, except for the fact that Smith decided that it would be a really good idea to bring a whole bunch of like egg masses into our house over the summer. Not of this species. And they weren't wood frogs, but they were toads. And I have to tell you that I'm We good. had two months of toads. Two months. Two months of toad tadpoles, which is too little. And the boys love them. <laughs> and, and daily release of them. Daily yeah. release. We paddled uh, <laughs> over 100 iterative kilometers together in the canoe to take these back, the uh, tadpoles that we were raising this summer back to their natal uh, corner of the river. Yeah. And then uh, toad biologists in Guelph are going to be like, what happened to the population? Boom. Yeah. yeah. Huge spike. Yes. Anyway. Okay. okay. Moving on. Now, oh. uh, let's clear, and this, is it a video? Yes, a so video. this is a, sp yeah. a sped up video. That, so just so you can see um, this process as, it, as they return to life. So Here we you're go. gonna run it and I'm gonna paste the link. Uh, but we certainly don't need to hear the music because- That's really, yeah. I feel like I should be walking in the mall or in an elevator. Spring is all about birth and rebirth. Uh, Jump ahead the to about 44 seconds. Go with it. Some plants and animals can oh. barely wait for spring. They're as impatient as I am. <laughs> Wood frogs are the first to awake. This amazing creature lives farther is, north than any other frog. If you're fast. And it can tolerate freezing. Yeah, that's right. It can freeze and then spring back to life. In this amazing video, you can see a frog frozen solid at negative 3 degrees Celsius. It has no sign of life. No heartbeat, no breathing, no observable brain activity. As the animal gradually warms, life returns. You think you're a deep sleeper? Look! Think about how dry those eyes are. Going, ugh. <laughs> and after he warms, he's right back out. As if nothing has happened, he's ready to breed and create the next generation of frozen frogs. Now, and you know, of course, that's a he. He was using the pronoun he. Well, the frog pulls Pause water it. away from its body origins and lets it. Uh huh. Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. Okay. Freeze in the in between spaces. Look. Imagine if we could do this. Suspend our lives and lose all signs of light, then spring back when times are good. Though we know how it manages to avoid freezing damage, much of this amazing feat remains a mystery and may well for quite some time. Okay. Um, what was that film on Netflix, the show on Netflix with the kids in the 80s that go somewhere else? Narnia? No. Oh, man. Come on, help me out here. Recent Netflix over the summer, and they go somewhere else, and there's a big, crunky, gross thing. Uh, Stranger Things. Yes. Where do they go? It's not the in-between, is it? I don't know. Is it the underground, the in-between? I don't know. But Smith used to have hair. <laughs> <laughs> under that no yeah this is just take a moment uh to reflect upon the upside down yeah so it's the, okay thanks so it's kind of like the in between or the upside down they they move the ice and they make the ice in the upside down in the in between spaces so doing my masters long ago i worked with amphibians and i worked with this particular species of amphibian because it's amazing and cool and that's what you do you try and work with amazing cool things that make you excited. So, and what I found, this is the small story that I have about freeze tolerance, because I was looking at enzymatic processes, but not ones uh, associated with cold. I was working with how amphibians in Ontario produce an enzyme that repairs how ultraviolet radiation damages DNA, and asking whether or not that enzyme was, con was correlated with how well populations were doing. And Which also was, whether or not wearing paisley shirts is going to attract members of the opposite sex. Oh, it did. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
<laughs> well, I don't know if it was in spite of the Paisley shirts, but <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, <clears throat> one night Smith is out. He doesn't. He needs. He needs tissue to assay enzymes. Right. You need yep. tissue. So that means killing and pithing things. And I don't really enjoy doing that. And I know, as an amphibian biologist, that moist nights, moist warm nights. There are many amphibians that get killed at road crossings. So I go out and I sit on a warm, moist night near a pond where a road bisects the pond, and I wait for cars to kill amphibians, uh, anorans, frogs, and salamanders and toads that are crossing the road. Then I collect those things that have been killed, and I take them back to the lab to then get enough species that I can conduct my assay about how well they have this particular enzyme. So I'm doing this, and I'm drinking my coffee or my whatever, and I'm sitting there, and I have a little. Yo I have six yogurt containers to each put in. So here's the blue spotted salamanders. Here's the American toads. Here's the wood frogs. Here's the green frogs. Here's all of the species of this area. And I take my yogurt containers and I go back. And I'm not going to do it that night. I put them. I go back to the lab and I put them in the freezer. So we go from having survived a winter in Peterborough, Ontario. So an, an average like a low winter low of cold to having warmed up and all these amphibians are active. And this is the the true spring to now being hit by a car and placed into the freezer at minus 20. They stay there for say a week, so I do this a few times so that I have enough tissue. Mm -hmm. Once I do that, I take them out onto the, onto the lab bench and I start dissecting out the tissues that I want so that it's all the same tissue type in case the enzyme varies in concentration between tissue type. As I'm doing that, a friend of mine comes into the lab and says, what are you doing? I give him this version of the short story. He says, that's cool. Why is that one moving? And I said, ha, 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 wood vine, that's very funny. And I look over, and one of the wood frogs is coming back to life. So this is a wood frog, a male wood frog, that had survived, had overwintered, had been frozen solid, had been struck by a car, had been, been placed in a freezer, so frozen again, which is the part that drives, like, I, I still can't quite understand. And then had thawed and came back to life successfully so two freezings and one car injury <laughs> so i kept this toe this sorry the, the wood frog for a couple of days to make sure that he lived and he wasn't like he was a little bit kind of like oh, cockeyed mm -hmm. but i made sure that i released him he did not enter <laughs> my study i took him to a pond that had females because i figured that in the end if there are genes in the wood frog population that allow you to freeze not just once but twice and survive being struck by a car these are genes that need to be passed on. So if you live in the greater Peter Patch area and eventually you are surrounded by unkillable, freeze solidable, <laughs> strike by a carable wood frogs, it's my fault. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and then there's this is yeah, but, 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 but. Oh, okay. this is delivered all in my facts. kind of a way. I know. What's with the text? I, I, I stick it out because there's, um, huh. there's visual learners, just like there's smell-based learners. <laughs> Snow-based learners. And these are maybe uh, okay. protein-based learners. Okay, good. Th these are all facts. Very yep. good. Okay, thank you. He lived and he was lived. returned to a pond. Yeah. I also deliver them in kind of an oratory way. Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit about winter flounder, and we've talked a little bit about wood frogs. I'm a frog wingman. I like one, of them, <laughs> one of them is a uh, freeze avoider, and the other is a freeze tolerator. Um, and uh, their, their responses, their life stories, uh, their pros and cons are different, and yet they are both here with us, uh, therefore evidence of the fact that these strategies work and that there are a d diversity of strategies associated with tolerating or, or managing the cold, right? Um, so, uh, in leaving, we're uh, are a couple minutes over already, um, here's a question for you. <laughs> Are there any freeze-tolerant endotherms? If so, who? If not, why not? So what are some of the physiological considerations at the different biological levels of organization, the different stimuli at the different time scales? What's up uh, with whether or not there are freeze-tolerant endotherms? Um, and then a bunch of other questions for you to kind of start thinking about as we go into the next uh, topic uh, that we're going to be talking about with respect to adaptations to surviving in cold conditions. And some of you have actually already stumbled across what that example that's going to be. Uh, somebody mentioned some uh, 
ground squirrel. Yeah, and then here you go. Just to help you, this is kind of pretty basic level, right? We're not like we're not like challenging you no, with difficult but like, questions. But or, this, organize your thoughts. Yeah, this may help. Um, who does what? Uh, think about some of the species, especially the ones that we have in the Arctic or the ones that we've discussed, and kind of put them in uh, to the different categories, the different columns, um, and hopefully. Um, you can keep on adding as we introduce new species and new, new stories to, to the rest of the, the course. This is good. Somebody's saying, what about birds? What about birds? We'll talk about birds, I promise. Dinosaurs. That's it for today. Thank you all very much. Take care of each other. Okay, and uh, we'll be back in Stay a Stay physically distant minutes. and socially connected. <laughs>